So hello, as you know, I'm Sophie Smith. I'm the Assistant Director of York Public Library. And I am so pleased to welcome you to the launch of our third annual climate series presented in partnership with York Ready for Climate Action and York Land Trust. As many of you know from attending our previous presentations, the focus over 2022 was the issues and impacts of climate change. In 2023, we focused on practical action steps. But in this year, 2024, we're taking another angle and looking how we need to rethink our lives as we acknowledge that we're already living in a climate change world. Tonight, we're rethinking climate activism, and in the next months, we'll del delve into rethinking local implementation, nature, recreation, housing, gardening, and consumerism. More information about all of the climate programs can be found on the library's website, yorkpubliclibrary.org slash climate. We are recording tonight's event and it will be available on that website in the next few days. By default, I have muted everybody, um, but you're welcome to use the chat feature to uh, put in questions and, uh, and communicate. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. So I am delighted to introduce our guest this evening. Bill McKibben is an author, educator, environmentalist, and likely needs no further in introduction in this crowd. Uh, he's also the founder of Third Act, which organizes people over the age of 60 for action on uh, climate and justice. I'd also like to w welcome Molly Shen, Tom Mikula, sorry, I should have checked that, and Chuck Spanger, who are instrumental in the success of the main chapter of Third Act. We're also joined by Anna Siegel from Maine Youth for Climate Justice to talk about the ways that they're engaging in local and national activism. I want to thank each of our presenters for making the time to be here tonight. But Bill, take it away. Well, Sophie, thank you very much for this kind invitation and for um, doing all the work to get this set up and ready to go. What a pleasure to be with everybody. Um, perhaps more of a pleasure for me than for you, because one of my jobs in the world is just to do a certain amount of bumming people out. And that's where I will start um, in a minute. Um, but I will say, though I live in the mountains on the other side of New England, um, the coast of Maine is a place that's very special to me uh, uh, and that I, I love enormously. My brother, uh, uh, is a lobsterman on Matinicus Island, and um, I, I know that coast pretty well, and and I think of it often. Um, though I chose to spend my life up in the hills, um, um, thank you all for taking good care of where you are. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight first is just the difficulties of taking care of any place in the wake of the crisis that we've managed to set off by raising the temperature of the earth. I, I wrote the first book about all of this now almost, well, uh, more than 35 years ago in May, I guess 35 years ago this year in 1989, a book called The End of Nature. And I, I'm afraid that 2023 was sort of the year that I was thinking of, it turns out, because last year really was the year when around the world we began to sense just how deeply we'd managed to start unraveling the physical fabric of our planet. Uh, right about this time last year, uh, oceanographer friends of mine from around the world said something very weird is happening with the temperature of the ocean. It's been, of course, going steadily up for 40 years, but all of a sudden it was spiking and spiking uh, very intensely, a spike that continues. I just saw the data for this year and uh, February is setting huge new scary records. That heat reached record levels by June. In Florida, we had ocean buoys recording sea surface temperatures of 101 degrees Fahrenheit off the Keys for weeks at a time. That's the temperature where you'd set a hot tub. Um, that heat moved on land by right around the solstice, which is always the hottest few days of the year globally averaged on our planet, just because the Northern Hemisphere has more land mass than the Southern. So this, the solstice in our hemisphere is the, the hottest. Those days, the climatologists were quickly saying, we're not only the hottest days that we've ever measured on this planet, our measurements go back about 200 years, they're pretty sure because they can read the proxy record in ocean core sediments and glacial cores and things 
that that the hot days on this planet around June and July last year were the hottest days we've had on this earth in 125,000 years at least. That is, uh, we're living through a hotter climate than anything that we'd recognize as a human society has ever lived through before. And of course, it's come with extraordinary consequences, which we see all the time. Some of them short term, those unbearable fires across Canada last uh, summer. <clears throat> Canada saw three or four times more acreage burn than ever before. In fact, those fires released three times as much carbon dioxide as all the cooking and flying and heating and driving and cooling that Canadians did last year. And the smoke blew down, certainly over where I live, and down into, perhaps usefully, the power corridor between New York and Washington, where the decisions that uh, ultimately will make so much difference get made. Maybe it was useful that for a few days, People in those places had to breathe the kind of air that so much of the planet breathes every day. Um, one of the other effects of a much warmer atmosphere is more evaporation. Uh, that leads to that drought, but it, uh, it also leads to much more precipitation and deluge and downpour. I know Maine had some of that last year. Uh, Vermont, where I live, I think was the absolute epicenter of it all. <clears throat> And my small town got more rain than any other town in Vermont last year. 35 inches last summer, we lost a house to a neighbor uh, to a landslide. Uh, uh, there was no way in or out of our town for weeks on end because the state road was closed in either direction. But Maine and Vermont are still affluent enough that they can sort of for a while deal with some of that. Not so true the rest of the world. Uh, at the end of the summer, for instance, Libya had the biggest rainstorm they've ever had. Uh, it dropped so much water in the course of a few hours that it washed out two big dams, and then that water roared through a coastal city and washed 10,000 people out to sea where they drowned in the course of an hour. Um, and that kind of thing happens pretty regularly now, especially in the poorest parts of the world. The, the iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you get hit. All of Africa has produced only about 3% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, um, and yet they're being decimated by drought and flood. Uh, the U.S., even though we represent just 3% of the world's population, has put about 25% of all the greenhouse gases in the air. No one, not even China, will ever catch up to us. And it's all still up there. I mean, the carbon dioxide that came out of the tailpipe of my family's maroon Plymouth Fury when I was getting my learner's permit in Massachusetts in 1974 is still up there in the air trapping heat, you know. Um, so that's the bad news. 2024 is likely to be hotter than 2023. We've clearly taken a new step up. The planet is now about 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer than before humans started in on things. That's the reason, for instance, that we're having a winter with no winter this, this year. Um, um, and, and such things will continue in so many ways. We're on a path now to raise the temperature of the planet just under three degrees Celsius, about twice as much as we have so far, unless we move very quickly. If we do that, then we probably can't have civilizations like the ones we're used to. The UN estimates that that would be enough to put at least somewhere between one and three billion human beings on the move as refugees. Um, Think about the damage to our political culture that one or two million refugees on our southern border has already done. Think about the ugliness and whatever that it's produced. Now multiply that by a couple of thousand times and try to imagine what the world's going to be like. But it's what it's going to be like because if you can't, if the, if the ocean has risen to cover your home or it's gotten too hot for you to grow food where you live, then you're going to try and leave and 
go somewhere else. That's just how humans are. That's the bad news. The good news, and it is good news, is that we have a much better sense of what to do about this than we did even a few years ago. The scientists and engineers have done a remarkable job. They've dropped the cost of renewable energy something like 90% over the last decade. We now live on a planet where the cheapest ways to produce power are to point a sheet of glass at the sun or to put up a windmill that captures the breeze as it spins. Um, that's incredible. That's a kind of miracle. I mean, I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, so call that a water into wine kind of miracle uh, that uh, uh, we have available to us. It's not perfect. You have to go mine lithium someplace and cobalt and uh, so on, and that can be done badly, and that often is right now, and we should do it better. But even at its worst, it doesn't come close to matching the damage that mining and burning fossil fuel causes. Nine million people a year die. Forget climate change for a minute. Nine million people a year die on this planet from breathing the combustion byproducts of fossil fuel, all those particulates and things in the air. Um, that's one death in five on our planet. And it's unnecessary now because we know how to confine combustion to the sun. Uh, we know how to catch its rays on uh, photovoltaic panels. We know how to take advantage of the fact that it differentially heats the earth, uh, producing the wind that turns those turbines. We've got to be willing to make some changes, and some of those changes will be sacrifices. I know right now there's people in Maine fighting over the idea of whether or not Sears Island should be a port for servicing those uh, offshore wind industry. I understand why people don't want change of that kind, but the point I'm trying to make is we are in an emergency, and in an emergency you deal with things in a different way. That's what tourniquets are. That's, you know, that's where we are right now. Um, and, and we need to move, and here's the real kicker, very fast. This is a timed test, which is unlike other tests that we're used to dealing with in our political life. Um, um, because if we don't move quickly, we'll pass tipping points from which there's no return. Once you've melted the Arctic, nobody's got a good way to freeze it back up again and restore the climate that we've known our whole lives. The scientists tell us we have about six years till 2030 to cut emissions in half if we have any hope of staying on the path uh, for the temperature targets we set at those big climate talks in Paris that you'll recall from about eight years ago. Um, 2030 isn't far away. Six years isn't a long time. It would take an all-out effort to get it done. It would be one of the harder things that human beings have ever tried. It would be really hard even if everybody was acting in good faith. But here's the really difficult piece of news, for me anyway, which is that not everybody is acting in good faith here. Uh, we've spent the last 30 years trying to overcome every effort of the fossil fuel industry to delay, to deny, to disinform, to obstruct, to obfuscate. It turns out, we now know from great investigative reporting, that back in the 1980s, when I was writing that first book about climate change, all the oil companies were busy studying this stuff too. As you would expect, Exxon was the biggest company in the world then. They had lots of scientists and their product was carbon. So of course they were gonna find out what was going on, and they did. Their scientists told their executives with stunning accuracy what the temperature would be in 2020 if we kept doing what we were doing. They were incredibly accurate and they were believed. Exxon's executives took note in the 1980s and they started doing things like building all their drilling rigs higher to compensate for the rise in sea level that they knew was coming. The only thing they didn't do was tell the rest of us. Instead, they spent 
billions of dollars hiring the people who used to work for the tobacco industry to spin just the same kind of tale. We don't know enough. Who knows what will happen? There's lots of doubt on and on and on. And they wasted 30 years. That's why we have to move at such an ungodly pace now. And if I sound resentful, it's, I think sometimes I am. I try not to be, but I think I am because it's a great tragedy that we were given this warning by the scientific community in time to act, but we didn't take that warning in large part because we were steered away and continue to be steered away by the fossil fuel industry. Um, at the moment, it's impossible to be an out and out climate denier or almost impossible. Uh, the former president of the United States hoping for a comeback is an out and out climate denier, which is yeah, who knows. But for the most part, even the oil industry now at this point has turned to delay as their main tactic. They say we must move slowly. The technology isn't ready uh, on and on and on. We have to move fast. That is our only hope. And that means that we have to build activist movements to allow us to push our political process to move more quickly. And that's where I'll end by talking about, because I think that's the topic Sophie really asked me to address. I'm not an activist by nature or background. I'm a writer. And it was only 15 or 20 years ago that I began to understand that writing another book was not going to move the needle sufficiently. We were winning the argument. We were just losing the fight because the fight wasn't about data and evidence. The fight was about what fights are usually about, money and power. And the fossil fuel industry had so much money and had so much power that they could lose the argument but not have to change their business model. That's when we started building movements to try, since we lacked billions of dollars, to begin to try and put some pressure of our own on this system. So I started something with some students, young people, called 350.org that became the first global climate action movement. We've organized 20,000 demonstrations in every country on earth except North Korea at this point. We were sort of spearheaded the fight to end the Keystone pipeline that you might recall and had this big fossil fuel divestment campaign that's become the largest corporate campaign of its kind in history. We're now at $40 trillion in endowments and portfolios that have uh, joined the effort to sell coal and oil and gas stocks. Uh, shout out to wonderful Unity College in Unity, Maine, which was the very first institution on planet Earth to divest from fossil fuel. Um, um, they didn't have a big endowment, but they were the first, and now it's Harvard and Cambridge and Oxford and the University of California and Princeton and on and on and on, but that's where it started. Um, the best part about that divestment campaign was that so many young people got involved on their college campuses. And when they graduated, they wanted to go on fighting. So they did things like form the Sunrise Movement that brought us the Green New Deal. And it was their call for the Green New Deal that once it had been run through the congressional sausage making machinery and produced this Inflation Reduction Act that is the first effort of the federal government to do anything substantive about climate change. Uh, it's not as big as it needs to be, nor as bold as it needs to be, but without those young people, it wouldn't have happened. And it's not just in America. You know about young people all over the rest of the world. <clears throat> um, you know about Greta Thunberg. Uh, she's one of my favorite people to work with. I adore her. I had the great privilege of getting to write her a letter in June congratulating her on her graduation from high school. Think about that for a moment. Um, um, so young people are doing their job, as you might expect, because they're staring down the barrel of this thing. They understand they're going to live their lives uh, haunted by this and that they have to get it uh, under control. But I heard one too many people my age say, oh, it's up to the next generation to solve this problem, which seemed 
A, ignoble, and B, impractical. Because for all their energy and intelligence and idealism, young people like Anna, who we'll hear from in a minute, and who I've gotten the opportunity to work with in the past, for all their, for all the great gifts that they bring, they lack the structural power by themselves to make change on the scale that we need in the time that we have. So I started asking myself who did have that structural power and the answer, at least in part, was people with hairlines like mine, okay? Um, there are 70 million Americans over the age of 60. That's a lot. That's bigger than the population of France. And we all, we punch above our weight politically because we all vote, all of us. There's no known way to stop old people from voting, okay? And we ended up with most of the country's financial assets. We're not all affluent, but 70% of the country's money uh, sits in the accounts of people over the age of 60. So if you wanna pressure Augusta or Washington or Wall Street, and I'd like to pressure all of them, then it helps to have some people of a certain age. That's why we started the third act, which you're gonna hear about in a minute from Molly and Tom and Chuck. Um, that's why we started it two years ago, and it has grown like Topsy. We've got chapters all over America now, and we are doing good work. Last spring, we had 100 demonstrations in 100 cities outside the big banks that fund the fossil fuel industry. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C., where there were thousands of us, and we shut down Chase and Citibank for the afternoon with a sit-in. We're too old to sprawl on the sidewalk for hours at a time. So we'd gone to the Goodwill uh, all around Washington and got every rocking chair that they had. And we had an excellent sit-in. The New York Times the next day called it the Rocking Chair Rebellion. Uh, we spearheaded the work this past autumn uh, to uh, get the president to stop granting new permits for LNG export terminals in the Gulf of Mexico. That sounds like a kind of technical thing, but it turns out to be the biggest fossil fuel expansion project left on the planet. If they'd kept building at the pace they were building, by 2030, US exports of fracked gas would have produced more greenhouse gas emissions than everything that happens in Europe. Every car and factory and home from Athens to Helsinki would be doing less damage to the climate than the export of American natural gas. So thank God President Biden stood up and said, we're going to pause these new permits for a while and see what happens. And thank God he did it because it saved us from a week later having to uh, descend a thousand old people on the Department of Energy in Washington and get arrested in the middle of February and things. Um, we were ready to go, but um, best actions are the ones you don't have to do. Anyway, that's the story of Third Act, and our pleasure is backing up the young people who are rightly leading this fight. I remember the very first demonstration we got involved in, it was in Boston, uh, and we were outside these banks, and there were two or 300 people, high school students, because there's always high school students, they understand exactly what's going on. And they were somewhat sprier, so they were at the head of the march. But at the back of the march, there was a huge crowd of us from Third Act with a banner that said, fossils against fossil fuels. So that was our contribution. And it was, I think, good for the young people who were there to feel like they weren't being abandoned to their fate anyway, that the rest of us were standing up to do something about it. I'll just end by saying, I can't guarantee to any of you we're gonna win this fight. We don't know. We're in pretty bad shape. The temperature is rising rapidly, but it's possible for us to win this fight or at least to do much better than we're doing. That'll require us acting. Some of that action comes at your own home or in your own neighborhood, which is good. I'm so glad that people are here from the York uh, environmental committee who are working on things like heat pumps and stuff, and that's great. But we're also past the point where we're going to win this fight one Tesla at a time. The most important thing an individual can do is be a little less of an individual 
and join together with others in movements large enough to shift the economic and political ground rules. That's why we set up things like if you're under 30, the Sunrise Movement, or if you're if there's anyone on this call who's over 60, uh, that's why we've set up things like Third Act. Tell your grandparents about us because um, we're having fun and, and causing all the trouble that we can. And I'm going to turn it over now to my colleagues at Third Act Maine and just say again, Sophie, thank you very much for having us and, and what a pleasure it is to get to be uh, uh, on the coast of Maine, uh, if only virtually, if only for a night. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Bill, um, for that uh, note of despair and uh, call to action. <laughs> we need it. Um, I'm Molly Shen, and I do a lot of my volunteer work with Third Act. The co-founders of Third Act are also on the call, Chuck Spanger and Tom McCulka, and other friends from Third Act are also on the call. So we're well represented here. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what Bill has inspired us to do here in the great state of Maine. So um, without further ado, I will share my screen and um, do just a couple of slides um, to introduce you to Third Act Maine. Um, my role at Third Act is actually on the communications team. We have a robust newsletter. You can subscribe to it at no cost. So I hope those of you who are inspired to see what we're doing around the state will sign up with us. But you can see here our mission statement. And I'm really glad Anna's on the call because we do try to partner with youth, support youth activism, but also bring them with us. Um, we're a multi-generational effort, even though Third Act is designed for people over the age of 60. Um, Let's see, why is this not advancing? Yikes, it worked before, oh, here we go. So as I said, um, on the call, Tom and Chuck are also on the call today. What we do, um, you know, Bill's inspired us to just get out there and protest at the dirtiest banks. Chase is the dirtiest bank on the planet for their investment in new fossil fuel projects. Um, so we've been standing out at the newest branch of Chase Bank up in Falmouth, uh, Yarmouth for a while now, and also downtown Portland and recently in Falmouth. We also protest at companies that partner with the dirtiest banks. And Third Act has um, helped us with a whole campaign around Costco, our first Costco in Scarborough, it turns out Costco is a great company, but they partner with Citibank. So we were protesting their partnership with a really bad bank. And similarly, I'm really proud of our initiative to protest outside the flagship store at L.L. Bean. As much as I personally love L.L. Bean, they too partner with Citibank. And if you have a Bean Bucks card, that's a Citibank card. So we've really urged the president of LL Bean to talk to Citibank or even change their partnership when the contract is up. It's something that we really hope um, down the road, Third Act nationally could get behind our protest at LL Bean. And then there comes to our own individual action. I cut up my Bean Bucks card and left Bank of America. And these are the hands of two elders in Belfast um, who did leave their um, Bank of America altogether as well and invested in a much greener local bank. So it's you know taking our individual actions and really trying to do symbolic action and group mobilizing. Another thing that we took initiative to do was explore the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is based in large part off of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty work that was so successful back in the 70s. Um, after Belfast City Council passed FFNPT as a resolution that they really supported governments getting together and creating a treaty to turn off the taps of oil and gas 
Um, we brought the same resolution to the Portland City Council, which passed it. And then with chutzpah, we took it to the state legislature. The House passed it, the Senate passed it. So now Maine is the third state in the country to have passed a resolution in support of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I personally am bringing it to South Portland. Other folks are bringing it to their towns. It's a symbolic action, but in the process, we managed to educate a lot of people about the need, not just to turn to renewables, but to turn off the tap of oil and gas. We have also urged the main public employees retirement system to divest from fossil fuels. And it turns out, you know, there's good evidence now, there's been research. It's not in um, their fiduciary interest to keep funding fossil fuels. If they funded renewables, had stocks and renewables there, the, the PERS system would actually be doing even better than it is now. So the interesting thing is the state legislature passed a law saying, yes, Maine PERS should divest. They haven't done it yet. We have a standout planned in the middle of March as the board is meeting at Maine PERS to say, plead with them, do the right thing, get out of fossil fuels. This is just a graphic about how we're organized. Um, when I was looking at the membership about uh, 13 months ago, we had 100 members. Now we have over 930. Um, and we've had to organize. And it's very cool to see regional hubs develop to do local action. So um, our hubs right now, we have Greater Portland, Mid Coast. Our newest hub is in Central Maine around Waterville and Greater Farmington. We'd love nothing more than to put another star on the map for Southern Maine, all you folks in York. Um, so here's just a little bit more about us. Um, the last dot, the special announcement today is we just decided today that we are going to apply to be a member organization of the Environmental Priorities Coalition, which chooses several bills each year to lobby the state legislature to pass. And we're really excited about that. Hope we, hope we are accepted. Um, we publish a newsletter every two weeks. You can get for free, even if you're not over 60. And last and not least, just wanna urge you to join us. You can go to thirdact.org slash main or email us at thirdactmain at gmail. And I'll be sticking around in case anybody has questions. Thanks so much for inviting us to participate. Oh, and I'll turn it over to Go ahead. I was just going to say thank you so much. If you do have questions as you're hearing the speakers, please put them in the chat and we'll be we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation. And Anna, if you'd like to go ahead and talk about the work that you're doing in Maine, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. So I love this conversation around shifting activism because I think that concept of changing how you act is something that I've been doing my entire life uh, in terms of with activism because uh, I really got into climate activism at a time when the way that the world was thinking about it was really changed. So I you know, love that perspective and really excited to chat about it. Um, so just quick introductions. My name is Anna Siegel. My pronouns are she, her. I am a senior at uh, a private school in Portland um, and high school. And I am the co-founder and advocacy director of Maine Youth Action. Maine Youth Action is an organization that fights for bold and equitable climate policy through grassroots and uh, direct lobbying efforts. I'm also a, a founding member and core member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice. Maine Youth for Climate Justice is a coalition and sort of a networking, brainstorming, and uh, movement hub space for climate youth organizations in Maine. Um, and so just thinking like to parse the two, many action is sort of like that political, uh, more you know, direct and pointed organization, many for climate justice is a coalition and sort of a movement space. 
And both of these organizations do incredible work uh, in different ways. And on a municipal level, I also work with my town, Yarmouth um, Climate Action Task Force. Uh, I, I worked with Yarmouth High School students through Maine Youth Action to pass a climate emergency declaration in Yarmouth, which set up our, the Climate Action Task Force and uh, created a mandate for us to make a climate action plan. And we are presenting this climate action plan next month to town council for approval. Um, and then I'm also on the Sierra Club Maine Executive Committee. So I'm doing like the high level visioning work there. So super exciting stuff. Um, I when I aside from answering emails, I'm also a birder um, and a hiker. Uh, happy to talk about some of like the you know if, if any questions arise about some of the naturalist things. Uh, sometimes people will ask me questions about you know see, seeing the effects of climate change locally in nature or about the intersection of ecology and climate activism. You know when it comes to mitigating, you know managing like how do we how do we be in service to the environment when it comes to like installing renewable energy happy to field any of those questions um i'm not actually a biologist but i will be going to school for it so um yeah, i'm also happy to answer more climate finance questions at the end uh, i what uh chuck and molly were talking about about pressuring main purse to divest from fossil fuels main youth action as an organization actually started after Myself, uh, other young folks such as Cole Cochrane, members from Sierra Club, and um, Representative O'Neill of, of, of SACO um, in the main house were working originally on the bill to divest main powers and fossil fuels. And then after that bill was passed, Cole and I were like, wait a minute, we need to get youth in politics much more directly in Maine because this was a very youth led effort. It was intergenerational, but had this really strong youth aspect. Um, and so I was really involved in that work to pass that bill to divest Maine from fossil fuels and am now continuing with the implementation project. It's very unfortunate that we now had to reconvene that intergenerational coalition to actually implement the bill. Um, but because of the way the Maine constitution works, there had to be language in the bill of, to make it constitutional. Uh, and that language has been exploited for them to just say, oh, we don't have to do anything, um, even though that is not the case. So also happy to field questions about climate finance and um, how to get involved with that locally because uh, there's some really, we're, do, we're doing really interesting work with it. Um, but to talk a little bit more about redefining activism and rethinking activism, I actually started my work uh, as an events organizer. I was just a strikes organizer. I, the global climate strikes on Fridays, the sit out, um, the, the March 15th and September 20th and December 7th global strikes in 2019 and 2020. That was really my role as an organizer was, you know, getting those permits uh, into city hall, making sure that the word was out, setting up speakers and then making sure that there were demands to rally around. My only real interaction with policy was around those demands because it was a really high priority of the folks organizing these strikes, including myself, to make sure there was something we were actually gathering people for rather than just for the point of gathering, um, that intentional activism. And a demand that we hit upon was these climate emergency declarations. So the, asking a town to do a certain amount of carbon drawdown by a certain year um, you know, by you know, 100% renewable by 2030 and so on and so forth. Uh, and we got these passed in municipalities all over Maine. These municipalities, because of these bills, now have climate action plans and uh, have climate action task forces. And it's really exciting. But then COVID happened. And along with a lot of other people, uh, I was out of a job um, because Portland said, actually, you cannot gather thousands of people for Earth Day and with your demands please don't do that. Um, and I actually got contacted by someone uh, when they when Governor Mills officially banned gatherings because they knew we were already gearing up for Earth Day in March. And they were like, hey, Anna, just, just so you know, uh, this is about to be announced. And it was still er those early days. And I was like, really? That seems like a bit of an exaggeration. Like, uh, you know, let's not let's not act too hastily. And then, you know, obviously, turns out that was a good move. Um, but I'm lucky because I'm a student and I'm in my parents' home, so it wasn't wasn't you know a real struggle for me economically. But I was kind of in a point where my role as an activist was kind of moot. I w did a lot of like coalition building on Zoom, 
and in, in you know kind of building up the main youth for climate justice movement and then getting much more involved with Sierra Club Maine like I got really heavy into electoralism because all you could do was like text bank and phone bank for political candidates I got disillusioned with that very quickly uh but it got me much more engaged with Sierra Club Maine um and then I got involved with politics because of the climate emergency declaration work there was this question of could we make the state of Maine have a climate emergency declaration, which became a moot point once the Maine Climate Council was established. But this, I started looking into what would writing a bill look like, and like could you write a bill, and like how does the legislature work, and those sort of want, like basic questions about civics that we just simply aren't taught in school, which was a huge learning curve for me. Um, and Maine for Climate Justice really facilitated that process, and then all of a sudden. I was working with Cole and we were writing policy about climate finance. And then we also were doing some work on a bill to lower the voting age. And then we started an organization to get youth more engaged in politics in this way. So super exciting stuff um, that shift from gathering people to for the sake of gathering to gathering people for a certain thing to then noticing that the world had kind of stopped paying attention to global strikes and thinking about how to channel energy in other ways, responding to COVID and the way the news cycle was th talking about youth, and then getting into this more politically oriented, very intergenerational space. Because I also think a really important way of shifting activism is exactly what Bill was saying when it comes to this mentality of we need to get let the youth lead, like almost too much. For so long, the youth were saying, like, we need like, we, we need our voice to be recognized. And I think that almost went too far at a certain point where adults were like, OK, I'm like, I'm scared of I'm scared of being yelled at by a young person. I'm I don't want to get canceled. I'm just like going to back off. And that there's no one to blame for that. That's just how narratives work. Like it could have been that youth were too aggressive. But I think that there almost got to be a point where. The adult allyship was a was sort of like we're just going to uplift your voice which is great love love it you know like, like good buzzwords uplift uplifting voices sharing seats at the table but it got to be a point of um just there wasn't like collaboration and as bill was saying if adults have the power and the money then that's not very effective so this intergenerational work i think is a way of shifting activism mindsets that is super important so i'm really grateful to folks like um John Hagen, who's an who is actually a PhD ecologist, and uh, you know, he does a lot of research also on like climate narratives, kind of taking his nature knowledge and applying it to like people and systems. Um, and so he created a group called Intergen, which was essentially a bunch of boomers and a bunch of Gen Z folks getting together and discussing climate and kind of parsing through some of these thorny questions. Like, what's the role of corporations in this work? And like, what does nuclear power mean to us? And it was super interesting. Um, and that kind of opened my eyes to the way that we need to do more intergenerational climate action. So I think that was kind of getting a little rambly, but just kind of like my thoughts around how I've personally shifted my activism over the years into different directions. And also revisiting old things. Like, I got really disillusioned with electoralism and I was like, I don't care about that anymore. I'm tired of putting my faith in people. And then I've kind of over time come full circle a bit to like, we do need to find climate champions. And I'm definitely disillusioned with the whole idea of like, if they're Democrat, they're fine. Like, like you know, just the whole sale, like endorse them if, 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 if they're blue. I really believe in the power of identifying and uplifting climate champions and even creating climate champions. Because as voters, you have the power to say, well, I'm only going to vote for you or donate money if you learn more about these X, Y, and Z policies. And then that person can then become more invested in environmental policy. But uh, yeah, so I think we've, um, I've also been revisiting the climate emergency declarations. You know, a lot of this stuff from my older phases of activism are still relevant. Like Yarmouth is now going through that climate emergency declaration process. But it's always good to kind of have these meta analyses of like what's working, what isn't, which is why I think this is such an interesting webinar. Okay, I will stop just going on now. Thank you so much, Anna. I appreciate it. Um, any reflections on what's working and what's what's like Anna was just saying um, from Molly or Bill before we start taking questions from the chat? Um, and, and do type in your questions as you have them. Well, I'll just say first thing is 
Anna is in a grand tradition of uh, Maine young people who have done played huge and important roles here. I can remember uh, when a young woman in high school named Chloe Maxman uh, called me up and asked me to come give a, a talk at a climate protest she was organizing at her high school. And I came and did it. And then when she got into Harvard, I said, you're going to have to lead the divestment campaign at Harvard. And then she did. Then she went back to Maine and ran for the state house and the state senate and was a big help in getting those divestment bills through. And then she wrote the book on uh, rural politics for progressives and on and on and on. So there's a extraordinary tradition here. And I think that what Anna said was so smart about uh, how it really is, does require everyone at this point. Um, and the particular, the particular thing that older people have to bring to bear here is just that accumulation of structural power over the years. Um, I said to someone the other day, if you've reached the age where you have um, hair growing out of your ears, you probably have structural power coming out your ears too. You know people, you, um, uh, you know how politics works, you, you know, so on and so forth. Look, uh, uh, this year, because it's such a critical election, a lot of the work that Third Act is going to be doing nationally over the next seven or eight months is going to be about that election, because, uh, you know, on even numbered years, that's one of the places where you have some leverage. And in this case, we couldn't have a sort of clearer set of choices uh, all over the country uh, uh, when it comes to these questions around climate and around democracy, which are the two issues that Third Act works on. Um, it's always, um, you know, politics is always a little disillusioning. Um, that's just how it is. But one of the good things about being older, perhaps, is that you kind of know that and it just, uh, uh, you know, there's no particular shock about it all. You just understand that you've got to work with what you've got and push them for change and, and do what you can. And, and we can do a lot. I was very impressed this past fall that the coalition of people made up of uh, activists from the Gulf South whose homes in the Gulf of Mexico were being taken for these LNG export terminals and Third Act kind of spearheading a national campaign were able in the course of five months to get fundamental changes in how we think about natural gas in this country. You know it's a big deal because the oil companies have been shrieking in response and pulling out every stop they can to try and uh, overturn what Biden did and so on and so forth. And Donald Trump has already indicated it'll be overturned on day one should he get back in power. Um, so, it, you know, we can get things done, um, um, but it does require us actually sitting down and doing them. Sometimes that looks like getting arrested, but not that often. Most of the time, it's the much more mundane work of Facebook posts, gathering petition signatures, lobbying, knocking on doors, phone banking. None of this stuff is unbelievable fun always, but all of it's kind of interesting. Uh, and I'll just end by saying, um, don't despair that it's impossible because apathy cuts both ways, you know. Um, and what the political scientists tell us is that if we can get three or four percent of the population really engaged in a movement, it's usually enough to win um, that because most people never get involved in anything. So our job is to not convince every last person who's a climate denier to come on board. I tell kids, you know, don't wreck your Thanksgiving arguing with your crazy uncle about climate change. It's not worth it, you know. But do sit there and talk with your sweet aunt who's probably worried about her grandkids and what's going to happen to them and try and get her to turn that worry into something, into some work, into a few letters to, uh, you know, Angus King, into a few uh, uh, letters to the editor of the newspaper, whatever it is to help push this process along. And I'll just finish by saying that for me, Maine has a great possibility in the year ahead 
Uh, offshore wind is going to be Maine's great asset in the renewable energy fight, and it's got to get done. And if it does get done, it'll be a huge economic driver, among other things, in uh, the state of Maine. Um, and and but it has to happen now. It has to happen quickly. And and so these things are always hard, but they are doable when people get together and push. That's why we set up organizations so that you can be more than the sum of your parts. And that's why it's fun to be with you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about nuclear power um, from Melissa Paley. She says, it's a privilege to be here in Zoom land with you. Can you talk about your changing view of nuclear power in light of the climate crisis? It's especially challenging for older environmentalists who are weaned on the no nukes on no nukes to rethink long held views. Well, I can try that one too, because I think she may be referring to my uh, views. Um, uh, look, I think that if you have an existing nuclear power plant that's already paid for, probably the risk assessment at this point is keep it open uh, while we're building solar panels and wind turbines and things. Um, it's not risk free but it is low carbon and that is good. Um, uh, in the long run, I think it's unlikely that nuclear power is gonna play a huge role here. And I think the biggest reason for that is simply that it's really expensive. It has to compete now with power from the sun and the wind, which is in the batteries to store them, all of which have gotten way, way, way cheaper. And I think the reason is, one of the reasons is that just as with communications, we kind of, the world sort of wants to be moving to a more decentralized set of platforms. Uh, our energy now can come from everywhere that there's sun and wind. It doesn't have to come from a few centralized power stations that are incredibly expensive uh, uh, to build. So I think that's the direction in which we're going. And I tell my friends who really love nuclear power as an idea, uh, you know what? The good Lord was kind enough to hang a large nuclear reactor 93 million miles up in the sky. We now have the wit to make full use of it, uh, and we should. So that's that's sort of how I think about it. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, from Mason Morfitt, he's recently read a poll that shows that Voters are most concerned with immigration, followed by the economy, and climate change was not even on the list that uh, that he saw. And so he wonders, under those circumstances, how can we be optimistic? And Bill, that could be for you, or um, if Anna or Molly have have something to yeah, say about that. Why don't you take a crack at that one? Sorry, did you say you? Why don't you take a crack at that one? Yeah, I yeah. Have some things to say too, but you you get first chance. My answer is don't be optimistic. Optimism is blinding, I think. I think it's, it's optimism is, optimism and hope, I think, are very tricky. Because psychologically, positive emotions lead to long-term sustained change versus like negative emotions and negative messaging it leads to like very short-term change in actions and then burnout and like despair. So obviously don't despair, but we need healthy cynicism of power structures in order to, to call for accountability and realism because without realism you can't operate with the facts under your belt and with the the knowledge to to make things happen um and so i, I guess it's, it's a bit of a cop-out for the question to take issue with the wording but uh i i also think that the reason that the electorate shows you know the polling shows those concerns is because it's what politicians tend to parrot is these sort of like very hot button issues that get, I mean, in the media world, like views and engagement because that translates to voters, which is very strange because that's the way things work. And I, my answer for that is really that the, the goal is to get more young people not only engaged in politics as voters or as like lobbyists or engaging in policy, but also as politicians. Because as Bill pointed out, one of the most influential players in main politics was Chloe Maxman, who was the youngest senator who's ever been elected senator in Maine. And that is huge. And so that's why Maine Youth Action is working on a project right now called the Maine Youth Political Portal, which will be an online resource and website to train young Mainers how to run for office. 
whether folks engage with this and decide to you know, become more better informed voters or campaign managers or just to volunteer for a local candidate or run for office themselves, that's really the answer because for me, I've noticed that what politicians think of is typically like their two years in office, their four years in office, they're like eight months in office, but youth tend to think about the 30 years before they can hopefully retire. And, uh, you know, and so it's, it's the, that long-term view that we need in our leaders. Um, and that's what really motivates me is, and kind of helps combat any negative emotions and gives me, you know, give, gives the realism a positive spin. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that um, to a certain degree, um, the more activism that people engage in, the more these questions register for people. In the 2020 elections, the number one issue for Democratic voters was climate change. And that was largely because Greta Thunberg had built this massive worldwide movement in the two years before that. And it was on the front of people's minds and they were demanding change. It doesn't happen automatically, but we've got a lot to work with. And I'm afraid this year is going to give us a lot to work with. Uh, the temperature of the ocean is so high right now that as hurricane season begins, we're in for huge trouble. Fire season in Texas has today, today in February, Texas is experiencing the second largest wildfire in its history, um, you know, on and on and on. That's the world we live in. And those are horrible things, but they also are Mother Nature giving us the openings that we need to help continue educating people about the absolute crucial passage that our species is either going to go through or not in the next few years. Um, and that's why the work that people like, like Anna are doing and the work that people are doing at Third Act Maine is so important. Molly did such a good job of kind of explaining the range of things that they're up to. And the thing to remember is that it not only gives you a chance to really make a difference in Augusta, it also gives you a chance to link up to a national movement that allows for enormous, enormous possibilities. Just to give an example, I mean, as this year goes on, uh, people from Third Act will have the endless opportunity to phone bank uh, and things in the most crucial swing states across the country as the election approaches. Uh, so if you look around, you know, your part of Maine and think, well, we're, you know, my neighbors are likely to vote the right way, um, then it's important to figure out how you can make sure that you're able to connect to people in Wisconsin or people in uh, Pennsylvania or people in Arizona who are gonna decide what all our future is like going forward. Um, connection, connection, connection. That's what movements are about. It's hard for Americans because our default is a kind of individualism in all things. Uh, we're a highly individualistic people. Um, but to a certain degree, the bad guys count on that, uh, on, on all of us staying separated uh, uh, and in our own worlds, and even if we worry about things, worry about, you know, are there solar panels on my roof? Is there an EV in my garage? I'm glad there are solar panels on my roof. I'm glad they connect to the EV in my garage, but I'm a hundred times gladder that I'm connected to hundreds of thousands of people now around the country who are fighting the same fight because that's what it's going to take uh, if we're actually going to make the change we need in the time that we have. And speaking of the time that we have, I have to drop off, I'm afraid. I have to go give a talk. In the, I kind of follow the sun around the continent, so I have to go give a talk in Oregon. Um, and I apologize for dropping off. Sophie, you may want to keep this discussion going, but such a pleasure to be with Molly, such a pleasure to be with Chuck and Tom, with all of you, and especially with Anna. She's going out of state for college for a few years. So you guys have to 
really rise to the occasion and keep Maine on the right track so that when she comes back in four years, you know, there's uh, some place left for her to be elected governor of. So go for it, y'all. And uh, uh, many, many thanks. Take care, Bill. Thank you. Sophie, do you want to say a few words to wrap it up? Sure. Yeah, I know there are still more questions and still a lot of, you know, energy and excitement in our group. And I'm, I'm so thankful that everyone has been here and, and engaged. I think that this topic was a really fun one to launch our climate series, you know, working with York Ready for Climate Action and York Land Trust and all of the different partners in our community to sort of put this series together reminds me just how many people care in New York about making this all happen. Um, and I hope <laughs> that someone does rise to the challenge that Molly gave you of uh, making a chapter, uh, you know, a sub Southern Maine sub chapter of third act. Um, but I, yeah, anyway, I just wanted to thank you all for coming. And, uh, you know, I, we can keep going if people want, but I also really do want to respect the time of everyone who's given it to me today. Uh, and so I think our best option is I'll, I'll link the um, resources that have been shared in the chat with the video when it gets posted so that any of the sort of the final uh, references can be seen. Um, and I invite you all to, uh, you know, keep up with our climate series to learn more about sort of, you know, what we're doing, you know, and what ways we can, you know, sort of make that positive change. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. And just a plug for our next uh, Rethinking Local Implementation on March 13th, we'll have Taylor from the Town Planning Department talk about what's going on in York, and Jerry Runte will be talking about what's going on on the state level. Um, so come and bring your questions, and um, it's good to be together when we're facing climate change and all the scary things that that means. So Anna, thank you for your time. Molly and Third Act, thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Good night.